Sure, yeah, if you want to if you want to share your screen and go. Awesome. Okay. So, I'll try to go as fast as I can because I think the the important thing here is to to have a discussion. So, yeah, I'm, I'll try to go as fast as possible. So, yeah, thank you Adam for the invitation. I'm really happy and honored to be here. Uh, my name is Jose Delao and I run a studio called uh, the Lao Design Studio. Pretty original. Uh, our motto is innovation through knowledge because we think that uh, uh, knowledge is a great way to to uh, to go around uh, the things that we don't know, right? So basically, we do three things. We do uh, what people know as uh, design research and human-centered design and things like that. We also do product design and. The fun part, we also do uh, uh, a lot of uh, speculative and critical design as a way for us to uh, challenge ourselves and learn new things. Um, also, I'm a full time professor at the Monterey Institute of Technology here in Mexico City, where we use a lot of the uh, critical design, the speculative design, and design fiction tactics so the kids can learn how to design. Uh, I also have a podcast. So if any of you know how to speak Spanish uh, and want to talk, uh, this is about design in Latin America, uh, you can find us as part of the Contexto. Uh, the Rich Network, uh, which we are part of, uh, it's a network of uh, uh, a lot of uh, design research agencies all over the world, so we're very proud of that. But anyway, what I wanted to talk today, which I think uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit maybe off script, but I think it's an interesting conversation to have. It's, it's about the aesthetic part of critical and speculative design, especially, especially speaking from where I come from and where I'm at, which is Mexico City. So to give you a little bit of a history lesson, maybe, uh, we have been really um, uh, like a hotbed of inspiration for the great minds in design uh, like here, uh, Joseph and, and, uh, and oh, I forgot her name, uh, her wife, his wife, <laughs> and it, sorry for that. But uh, they, they famously traveled to Mexico and got inspiration uh, on, on what they saw. Like here, uh, these like sketches from uh, Joseph Alvarez, uh, as, as he imagined the, the pyramids in Mitla in Oaxaca uh, in different ways, or the textiles of and I hate myself because I forgot her name. Uh, my, my wife is, uh, is, is listening, so she's a textile designer, so she maybe she can write down the name. But uh, again, it's kind of like uh, Annie Albers. Thank you very much, Lacey. Uh, it's, it's because I'm nervous, it's not because I don't care. So uh, they, they famously like, like come to Mexico and to get inspiration, the same thing with Alexander Girard, who has famously a great uh, uh, craft collection where uh, he took a lot of inspiration, including this uh, uh, concept for a Mexican restaurant that, that he and the Imps made in New York uh, in the late uh, 50s, I think, which was called La Fonda del Sol, which is like a superb translation uh, of taking Mexican aesthetics and, and popular art and in, into modernism. Uh, and also like this uh, New Mexico aesthetic that he kind of like champions. Another example is uh, Lance Wyman, which he, uh, uh, American graphic designer who was the responsible for the real iconic uh, I graphic identity of the 68 Olympics. He also designed uh, all the icons from the Mexico City subway. So if you ever come to Mexico City and you travel by the subway, you will, you will find out that we have like a really cool icon that describes the station that, that you're at uh, in a way to, to help people or initially to help people who, who couldn't read uh, to tell them where they were. And uh, that's, that's how the, the subway in Mexico City looked like when it, when, when it just opened, kind of like a modernistic utopia. It doesn't look like that at all right now. And uh, he also designed one of my favorite logos for a pasta company, like in Mexico, we eat pasta, not like the, the, the Italians, but we have like really long pieces. We, we, we eat them like soup in a way, kind of like what you eat, uh, you know, like, uh, like these like Mickey Mouse shaped pasta soups, things like that. So that's pr pretty popular. But in the end, we kind of like, like learn how to like from them, from people that, that came outside 
to Mexico, get inspiration and, uh, and have a modernistic, modernistic approach. We also, as locals, we, we understood like how to translate our aesthetic uh, the values into a more modernistic way, as we can see, what well, Calapor said, a Cuban designer in the 60s uh, or 50s, who also took like uh, interpretation from of vernacular furniture and with a modernist approach. Same thing with Pedro Ramirez Vasquez, who also in the, in the 60s, 70s, 50s, like in the Mexican modernist era, he also took like interpretation from vernacular and with, with modernistic values and more uh, contemporary, in a more contemporary way, we kind of like learned this way to kind of uh, take the essence of our aesthetics and making it modern, making it uh, ready to have a global conversation, you know? And uh, which that kind of like troubles me in a, in a way because when you uh, boil things down, especially when things are like really complex, then you're kind of like, uh, like whitewashing uh, culture in a sense. So, and, uh, and that's kind of like the, the approach that we, we try to find out. So this is an, uh, uh, when we take inspiration from, from the Mexico City aesthetics and the colors and things that we found are really cool. In the way, that's not how things looks like uh, where, where I come from. So when I ask myself how those, uh, the future is going to look like from my window, it's not going to look something like this that is clean, that is, you know, like a modernistic approach is going to look something more like this, which, uh, oops, uh, let's go back. Here we go. So this taxi is uh, Mexico City was famous to have like uh, these Volkswagen bills, but now this is kind of like the standard of Mexico, Mexico City taxis, which most of them are pink and they're like tune up. They're like these like compact Nissan cars, but with a lot of self-esteem uh, in the sense that they have like uh, this fantastic aesthetic. I, I took this picture actually riding a, an Uber and uh, the, the Uber stop and then I look to, to the right and there, there was like this extremely sexy taxi and I had to take a picture of it. And that kind of like keep me uh, reflecting of, of the true aesthetics of what uh, things are gonna look like because in Mexico, we are messy. We are not really into functionality, we're more into emotion. So, so how, if I'm going to, to practice critical speculative and, uh, and uh, this type of design, how it's going to look like if it's from, from my context. So really quickly, I'm going to talk about two projects, one from my studio, one uh, an academic project. <laughs> Um, little graphic that I that I did that I think it's uh, it kind of like shows most of us follow uh, the a good way to to do uh, a great speculative idea, but uh, aesthetically speaking, I like to uh, to to talk about an exercise that is work in progress, but I think it's 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 kind of like uh, trying to ask to answering the question: What if we use critical design tactics for an aesthetic study. So we started to, to think about, okay, so if I'm going to, to do future objects that are going to be technological, but for a Mexican context where most of the, which I'm going to talk about later, which much of, most of these uh, uh, configurations of objects are like, you know, the, the white shiny plastic, like uh, uh, Paolo Cardini famously says uh, all the time, uh, what if we take uh, inspirations to, to, from some from somewhere else? Uh, so so we started to, to look into into nature, and start using this kind of uh, uh, tactic inspired by uh, by Joseph Albers uh, to to understand uh, color palettes that comes from nature, and uh, also trying to do this uh, electronic uh, experiments so we can take out the 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 human aspect of it. So telling them the machine one day so, so we'd make this little program where we feed them one of the images that I just saw and they will give us back these pixelated animations that where we, we use also as a starting point to, uh, to start uh, building and trying to find how surfaces and color will interact with each other and trying to use uh, shapes because like normally we, if, if we want to approach uh, and let's say uh, an electronic appliance more into the emotional way, perhaps the, the functionality is not that important. 
So we are, uh, so we created these totems, which are actually right there on, on my back, where uh, we create them as color, pal like a material palette or like a volumetric color palette. So we can start building these objects. You will see, and uh, this, this project is evolving. So hopefully early next year, you're going to see the result of this. So that's kind of like to, to shift a little bit the, 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 the paradigms that, that, that we have on visualizing how the, the, the future will look like. And the other one, it's a project, it's an academic project that I that we did with a, a really uh, popular Swedish brand that I'm not allowed to say. So instead of putting their logo, I just put this abstract uh, composition uh, that they do uh, among, uh, uh, you know, like flat parking furniture and things like that. They also have a, um, uh, this uh, home smart division that they are trying to push. And since this uh, company, which I, sh I shouldn't name, they just opened a store in Mexico, they approached our school and they wanted us to, uh, to, to tackle the idea of how these smart objects would relate to, to a Mexican market. So uh, we, we took, instead of, we took first an, a human-centered design approach for the students, uh, uh, the company, I almost said the name, the, the company gave us some, some, some gadgets and we gave them to Mexican families and the students were uh, like monitoring them and, and observing kind of like what, what Tammy was saying that it's really important to observe what's like the everyday life and, and the everyday aspect. But then uh, instead of coming up with a like, like, like a boring report or something that, that the insights are like in, a, in an abstract way, we try to shift it into or use critical design tactics to talk about these insights. So for this, uh, this, this uh, uh, project, for example, the first team of students, these are uh, undergraduates, like they're doing their bachelors. Uh, actually, we also did this project during uh, lockdown. So it was quite frustrating because uh, they, they, a lot of the physicality was, we, we, we couldn't be done. But here, and talking about physicality, they, they realized that people here in Mexico, they like to have uh, the, uh, a really tactile aspect of electronics. So uh, normally when we think about the, the evolution of technology, we want to, to get rid of the technology, right? So, so we don't have any more buttons, we don't have any more clicks, we don't have any more tangibility. So they tell the, the designers of this company like, hey, it's, it's fine to have this tactability. It's fine to have sliders and things that crackle and, 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 and click and make noise and I, I feel them and that's important for us. So through, by doing this kind of like a catalog of, of uh, little interactions uh, was a way for my students to tell them, uh, you can look at this way. Second uh, project that, that uh, from an, uh, a different group was this space uh, uh, divider, where uh, we, we had one of the, uh, of the automatic uh, cartons, uh, but um, instead of like trying to use them to, to, to block light or like uh, cover a window, the students realized that in, in a lot of places in Mexico, there is a lot of negotiation with space because we are used to, to live like big families in, in small places and they interview this family where uh, two sisters uh, were uh, sharing a, a bedroom and they shared the space in different times. So one was at the university and the other one was, uh, I think, working. So one would have to, uh, so how can you help them to negotiate this space and perhaps by hacking this kind of like uh, uh, curtains, like these automatic curtains that they, you can uh, uh, automatically can divide this type of spaces. But in the same time, you don't want a boring, you know, like gray black light divider. Maybe you, you want something that happens and that's also important for us in Mexico. So also the, 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 the students looked from uh, inspirations of what will people will like to have in their houses instead of just like a, a white cube, which was interesting. Uh, second, uh, well, one, another nice example was uh, to build a set of, uh, of uh, house appliances that, uh, that they will have to have color and they would have to not only have a, a functional approach that what I said before, but also an emotional approach. So what it's interesting here is, is like a, a Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth speaker, um, 
a, a lamp with this mechanism that you can play with it, um, a sensor, but most importantly, there is a little box where you can uh, save your own things, uh, like like your, your mementos, which also is important, which the, the only functionality of this object is, is an emotional one, because the, the students find out that for us, it's really important to also to have this type of objects to, to ch cherish things, but also to give them to the older generations. So it's kind of like, a, how do you say this in English? Um, yeah, like uh, things that you can pass on. And last but not least, which I think it's also like a great example was that this last group of students find out that uh, people here in Mexico are like really intimidated by technology because it's uh, it's really like seamless and it's, uh, you know, it's it's kind of like its own thing. Heirloom, thank you very much. Snacky Shadow Studio. Anyway, so here, um, here in this, uh, in this proposal that the students uh, thought about, which I found really interesting was that, that it's, it's also fine to think about the future by looking at the past. So here, instead of like trying to get inspirations from, from something that is like really technological and, you know, like and super techy and, and like, in, like with LEDs and things like that, they started to think about how the technology started to emerge from when it stopped doing being furniture and became the, its own thing. So it's it's kind of like you know like in the 60s, 70s where everything was a little bit at least in Mexico you know like backlight with a lot of texture that that has to look nice but elegant but classy. And so so they designed this uh, this set of uh, smart objects that could also uh, live with. What like with the with uh, you know like in this case like this uh, cer uh, ceramic figurines that people might have in Mexico instead of having like this cultural shock of technology, uh, cultural shock of technology and things like that. So yeah, um, I'm really happy to learn what you guys uh, think about everything I said. I hope it makes sense. Um, uh, it's this is like my my second lecture of the day, so I'm a, I'm, I'm I'm a little bit go on now but uh yeah i would like to know what you guys uh, how, how you guys react with everything being discussed well thank you so much and we we definitely appreciate you doing back-to-back -back lectures on our account that must especially over zoom it's even more tiring first first jake is doing like a virtual whiteboarding not even using miro now we got the back-to-back -back lectures this is great non virtual um, <laughs> non virtual, yep. non virtual, yes. Is this digital? Is that what is that the, whenever they do that? Um, we we all we have yeah we have about ten minutes. Um, if people have questions and they want to ask, you can either type them, um, or you can you can un, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask if you would like to. And if not, um, I will just keep talking. Because I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, we do have one question. Um, Lacey was curious if you could talk a little bit more about using ancient history as a prompt for futures projects. And I imagine some of the other panelists might have thoughts on that too. But Jose, if you wanted to start. Mm, well, like going, like looking back has has been like a, like a really interesting resource, like inspirations resource when, when like, let's say, like when you watch Dunes, right? Which, uh, or like even like Star Wars, which uh, the thing that makes, that makes it believable is the fact that you have things that look old, right? So let's say that the military uniforms from Star Wars, they, they are not like extremely technological. They, they make sense because they inspired on, uh, I think in uh, German uh, World War II era type of uniforms also, which gives an interesting, um, layer of telling them that these guys were the villains. And um, what I think is interesting is like, yeah, like if you go all the way back and like when, like the, the word that you used, ancient, maybe I, I, I use it, I don't know. Uh, when like going back when, from an era where things were simple and that's kind of like nostalgic, that's, that's quite interesting. But what I like to, to, to reflect on when we design things from the future and things like that. It's that 
there is a bunch of things that doesn't have to change, right? There is this, I mean, I think there's a great example. There is this, uh, I don't know how to call it, anime, like this uh, uh, Jap Japanese animation series called Cowboy Bebop, where uh, it's kind of like a mix between uh, like noir cinema, but also spaghetti Western that it's happening in the future and on space. And if you see, there is like, like, a, like a great balance between something that is like really technological, but also things that are like, as it is, for example, they still use guns, like, like regular pistols. They don't use like lasers and stuff like that. They, they, they use guns that shoot bullets out of them and they smoke something that looks a lot like Marlboros. They, they don't have like these weird fancy um, cigarette thing and they light them up with, with Zippo's lighters. But when you see that contrast in this uh, future scenario, that's when it gets familiar yet weird, right? Which is kind of like that sweet spot that, that, that we like to, to, to get. So like, remember that I put like this, this, um, this graphic that says like a good speculative idea and a really bad speculative idea. I think it's about to have the right amount of ridiculousness. Because in the end, uh, when, when we think about the speculative design, most of it has to be built with current phenomena. If it gets too crazy, then people are just going to disregard it and, and talk to you about crazy. So maybe it's not about, and, and, and I'm reflecting what I'm, while I'm speaking. So maybe it's not about uh, looking into Asian things, but into existing things that could be from the past, could be from the present that probably are going to happen in the future. So in that sense, it's, it's a really interesting tool to, to make what, what, the, what is called a para-reality, which is like a, a reality, a fictional reality that is mostly based on uh, current things or like current phenomena. So yeah, I hope that, one, that answered your question. And then Jose, there was, there was one, it looks like you did, you answered it. Um, and there's one more question for you. Um, and it's about the, this mysterious Scandinavian country that we're all not sure what it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, you've got- I, really I'm good. Sweden, I can say that they're from Sweden. Okay, the, the <laughs> legalese. Um, they're wondering if, if you experienced a, a different designed aesthetic, a different design aesthetic. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how to ask it. Um, if you experienced and how you navigated a different design aesthetic than you're accustomed to um, when thinking about this Scandinavian country, I think basically, I think the question is like, how did you navigate the the aesthetic of of your home, what you see out your window, um, and the mm -hmm. aesthetic of this Scandinavian country? Yeah, yeah, and that's and that's a great question because of course when we think about the Scandinavian design, especially in countries like Mexico or Latin America. For us designers, especially when we're starting up, we, we look up to that. It's in, in a way, it's kind of like, uh, uh, how do you say this in English? Like, um, anyway, uh, you, you look up to the, it's like, like you want to reach that and you want to become that. And that's kind of like, maybe like, like the process of growing. So first you, you aim to something that you are a fan of and then to aspire to thank you, Doc Martin. Uh, by the way, I finished uh, Cyberpunk. A bit disappointed, but we can talk about that later. Anyway, so going back to design, um, when uh, it it was really hard to 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 change the chip, as we say in Mexico, that that we are we were not designing uh, functional Scandinavian design. We were we were trying to 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 inspire this company into change this type. Of so we have to kind of like uh, have a um, almost like a, like part of the process was to to unlearn what we think about good design is, which which is always unlearning something is fascinating because it challenges you everything you think about and it makes you and also it expands uh, new things. So for example, uh, the, the the designers from from the company they they were really confused at first that we wanted to, to put so much color, for example, into objects. 
or uh, that that the the objects were not you know like uh, the the main reason was not functional but i think an emotional need also has to be um, fulfilled through physical functional objects so and and in a way what what it was interesting is also it opens up a new conversation that uh, not all of us have the same priorities of what we want or want or why we buy the things that we do. And I think that's kind of like a pretty interesting. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if that's kind of like what, what the person asking ex was expecting. I think, I think it was. Um, in the interest of time, and there, there was another question or two, um, but I think I, I have I have I have thoughts about how to share the conversation later so we can keep it going. But in the interest of time, um, we'll we're going to switch over to to Kelly. Um, but that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs>